just finished reading that one fantasy book that's set in a world where there are dragon riders and when they bond with their dragon then they can communicate telepathically and they like train to fight battles and stuff. No, not that one. The world has different groups that you can join when you're like becoming an adult and one of the groups is clearly way cooler than all the other ones and the members all wear only black and have tattoos. No, the members aren't allowed to communicate with their families and they're allowed to kill each other at any point and some of them are there for glory and some of them are there because they have to be there. No, it's mostly a school where they're learning how to control their powers. No, the main character is a girl, and there's a light-haired love interest that's way too concerned about her safety, and a dark-haired love interest that might sort of be her enemy, but also wants her to have control over her own life, even if it means taking risks. Nope, not that one. But there is a part where a group has to all come together and work to steal something using their individual special abilities. No. It's kind of about magic and knives but it's mostly about this girl and her relationship to the guys around her. No. No! It's Fourth Wing. I'm talking about Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros, and I'm so excited to be talking about Fourth Wing because after I record this, I can finally go see what everybody else has been saying about it because there have been so many reviews and so many videos, and I have been avoiding them because I don't want anyone else's opinions to influence my own, so I went into this book knowing only that it was super hyped up online and I got to experience it and I am desperate to know what everyone is saying about it because I am sure everyone's got thoughts. I definitely have thoughts. Here are my thoughts. My experience reading this book was not unlike the experience of going to see a pretty good local cover band. Was it earth shattering? No. Am I going to become a lifelong fan? Probably not but I recognized a lot of the hits that I have come to enjoy over the years, and I had a pretty damn good time. Fourth Wing makes me nostalgic for 2009. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it just reminds me so much of the YA books that I was reading around that time. And here's the thing. This probably should have been a YA book. It reads like a YA book, but then with some vague sexual references through the first like 70%, and then some graphic stuff later on, but the characters are interacting in a way that does not feel unlike how teenagers interact. And the vague sexual references of like... And also, you know what else? Sometimes people do it. Did you know that? Sometimes people here are doing it. Sometimes I'm here. I'm here doing it. Because I'm 20 or 21 probably. Bam. And to me, it didn't feel like, oh yes, these are adults. It felt like, oh, these are big children. And they just made me feel weird. I had the hardest time, I think, with the protagonist, Violet, who's 20, and my brain kept making her younger than that. I think it's partially that she's the youngest child of, like, three in her family. You meet her when she's meeting with her mom, which then, like, to me says child, and she's going into the rider's quadrant, like, the dragon rider's quadrant of the military training stuff, which is, like, school. So that all together feels very much like she's going away to boarding school and not like she is an adult who is going to train for the military. This book is set almost entirely in military training compound and the different jobs or functions are in different quadrants. So Violet, our protagonist, was all prepped and ready to go to the scribes quadrant. And then her mom, who is a ranking, like high ranking dragon rider general, was like, no, you're going to the rider's quadrant like your siblings. Her brother died being a dragon rider, and what's the smart thing to do when one of your kids dies doing something? Make the little other one do it too. Violet also has a tendency to be injured, and to be injured more severely than other people. I think the implication is that she has something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, I think that's the name of it, where your joints are kind of stretchy and prone to being dislocated and stuff. Um, I've been told it's possible I have a very mild form or like other form of that because of how stretchy my face skin is. So Violet's prone to severe injury, she's small, she's unprepared, and just all in all she's probably gonna die going into the rider's quadrant. Like it's not for her. So she gets there and her childhood friend is there and goes, what are you doing here? And she explains and he's like, no, we're gonna sneak you back out over to the scribe's quadrant, you can do your little scribble scrabbles on your parchment and not get absolutely toasted alive by a great beast or like stabbed by your classmates or something. How's that sound? And me as the reader, I was like, I recognize that's not the best move plot-wise, 
but it makes sense. Like, it makes sense to do that. So when Violet decided to go all stubborn and go, No! I'm staying! You don't believe in me! And also, if I snuck out, my mom would be so mad. That feels YA to me. That feels like a teenager response to things. Other people might disagree, but I feel like the frustration I felt with her is what I often feel with, like, teenage protagonists, where I'm like, you stubborn, impulsive moron. And that's usually the sign of a well-written teenage character, but still, this is not supposed to technically be like a YA book. The characters just feel like teenagers, and one of the love interests, the childhood friend one, is described with a beard, and when I read that I went, no, beards are for big boys. You don't get to have a beard in my head. Usually I'm adding beards to hot guys described in books. Everybody gets a beard in my book, except for children, and these characters feel like sort of children. So that's kind of how we start the book. Violet is going to the Rider's Quadrant to probably die or maybe become a dragon rider. And I needed a riderscquadrant.edu landing page with a calendar of events so I could keep track of every near-death experience scheduled for these kids. There's the slippery 18-inch wide bridge of death just to get to the Rider's Quadrant. They're preparing for an obstacle course that's up a cliff. There are regular challenges where you have to fight your classmates who are literally allowed to kill you anytime you're not asleep. There's a parade past the dragons where the dragons will torch you if they sense weakness. There's the dragon claiming event where the dragons will also torch you if they sense weakness or your classmates will kill you. There are team challenges. There are war games because there is an actual war going on. That's why they need the dragon riders. And this whole time, Violet's surrounded by marked ones who are the children of executed traitors and they're forced to be in the Rider's Quadrant as punishment for their parents' crimes, and they're called Marked Ones because as part of that punishment they also get to have sick tattoos. Marked Ones hate Violet because her mom is a high-ranking general in the army that executed their parents. And one of those is Zayden, whose dad was like the head guy in the rebellion. Zayden's also the oldest of the Marked Ones, like the first one that had to join the Rider's Quadrant. He's got dark hair, he's super hot, he's got like a scar through his eyebrow. I think we all know where this is going. And in the very beginning, as Violet's getting ready to go to the Rider's Quadrant across the slippery, tiny, no railings bridge, everyone's like, even if you get over there, Zayden's probably gonna, probably gonna kill you. Speaking of the killing people part of things though, it's mentioned as a distinct possibility a lot, especially in the beginning. So I was expecting more tension related to that throughout and I did not feel that. It wasn't like in the Hunger Games where you're like, life or death every moment. Even the marked ones who were directly threatening Violet, it was more like, I'm gonna get you, Missy. If there is a sanctioned event that would facilitate me getting you, like maybe a formal challenge. Your mom killed my parents and I might, I might kill you if I get a convenient opportunity surrounded by witnesses everywhere. Even though technically someone could just stab her in a doorway. Like, this is a fantasy book, so we should probably talk about world building at some point, and I found the world building in Fourth Wing to be... present. There was a world. It had components to it. Some of them were more confusing to me than others. Um, they have a vaguely defined polytheistic religious belief system. They use our months. Maybe, I don't remember them mentioning days of the week, but I know they mentioned the months because I was like, did you just say October? Who told you guys about October? They also have stopwatches, which I had to stop myself from thinking of them as like the modern digital like track and field stopwatches. I'm sure they're more like a clock. That's all fine. But I was like, okay, you have stopwatches and you have shoulder surgeries, but you can't use pens unless you have magic. Otherwise you have quill and ink but if you have a dragon and you can use magic, you are able to draw the ink down the apparatus and write with a pen. The pens get mentioned like two or three times. And Violet was so excited at the possibility that if she gets a dragon, she can use pens. All right, girl, reach for the stars. I won't pick on it too much because human beings in our world might have also invented stopwatches before we got around to like fountain pens or ballpoint pens. I just enjoyed that Violet was so excited about the pens. What felt more sort of incongruous to me, I think, was some of the downright millennial language that slipped into the dialogue in this book. Batshit crazy, um, for the win, multiple times, 
and hijacked. So that took me out of the story a bit. And I think that slang is kind of a symptom of a larger disease in this book, which is that some of the dialogue is noticeably and horribly bad. Not all of it by any means, but there are points where it's just like, what did you just say? I saved this line. So Viola's talking to her older sister, who's also a dragon rider, before she goes to the rider's quadrant. And the older sister is like, you should cut your hair because it's better in battle. And also Violet has hair that like turns silver at the end. She has like a silver ombre going on naturally because of reasons. And it's very distinctive. And so like the marked ones will recognize that she's Violet, the daughter of this general, and they'll go after her and she'll be like more noticeable. And Violet's response to the suggestion that she should cut her hair to like disguise the color is, you know very well the natural pigment seems to gradually abandon it no matter the length. And I marked that because I was like, dude, you could have just said, it'll turn silver again even if I cut it. You could have just said, it doesn't matter, it'll just turn silver again. What is going on with that line? You're gonna say that and then you're gonna say something that's like, dragons for the win. Who's gonna hijack my dragon? Let's try to meet the vibe a bit with the dialogue. And as I alluded to, there are so many cliches and tropes in this book. They are everywhere. You know that thing in like a war movie where there's a soldier who pulls out the picture of his sweetheart and is like, I got my girl waiting back home for me. And you're like, oh, that's so sweet. You're definitely about to die. And then he gets blown up five seconds later. That happens early on in this book, like almost exactly. And I laughed out loud. There's also the like trope of someone reveals that they have a bunch of scars and then someone else is like, gasp, what happened to you? That's there. I rolled my eyes at that one more. And overall in this book, the foreshadowing is about as subtle as a slap on the ass. There's a lot of like, but that hasn't happened in a hundred years. So then I was just waiting for those things to happen. Despite all of that, or even because of all of that, I really had a good time with this book and there were some things I very much enjoyed that are kind of tropey or like could be considered kind of tropes. I am a sucker for a main character who has some sort of distinctive physical feature like yes Violet has her white hair of some kind and then maybe like calico eyes that wasn't clear to me what's going on with her eyeballs but some sort of cool like oh she's special sort of feature. I think that's cool. I know it's a cliche. I don't care. And I like dragons. I like dragons. Give me a story with some dragons and I'm probably there for it. I can be a little picky about my dragons. I want them to be proud and wise, definitely wiser than humans. Um, fierce, but like a little, a little grumpy and a little arrogant, powerful. I also like that the dragons and riders had like the mind reading communication thing going on because I like it better when the dragons can talk back. So that was done well. This book had pretty good dragons, but I wanted more. There were other things I would have trimmed or cut or gotten rid of to have more of the dragon and rider interactions. I didn't feel that bond as much as I wanted to. That's okay. So in this world, when you bond with your dragon, you get like low level magic like you can use pens, but then also after that bond has developed a bit, you get like your big power and you don't know what it's going to be. It's kind of a surprise and it can take you off guard and it can kill you. Like if you have flame powers and you are out of control with your flame powers, your flame powers can make you die. And if you manifest mind reading powers, like if suddenly you can hear everybody's thoughts, first of all, you're probably gonna go nuts, but also one of the professors in the quadrant can just come and snap your neck and kill you because mind reading powers are also not allowed. So that sort of unknown and different element to the magic system was interesting to me and I like that. But yeah, I don't know how many books are supposed to be in this series. I'll probably show up for the sequel. I will be interested to see how the series carries on and what I will think of this first book after that. Because I feel like a lot of the times you look back on the first book in the series and you're like, what was that? So we'll see. Overall, I give this book a solid 3.5 stars. I really had a fun time reading it. I can absolutely see it being somebody's like first foray into fantasy. I see why it's super hyped up and I don't begrudge it that hype. Like 
it's fun. Sometimes you can just read a book that's fun and you can laugh at the cliche parts and you can think that it's nice and familiar and it's just all good. It's summertime. Just read stuff you like. Who cares? I would love if you would like and comment and subscribe. I didn't get that. Could you try again? That scared the shit out of me. Subscribe to my YouTube, Siri. Do whatever you want. You're in charge of your own life. I'm not the light-haired love interest. I'm the dark-haired love interest. I should probably get a scar through my eyebrow and start telling you everything is your choice. <laughs> Have a good one. Catch you later. Bye.